Hello and welcome to another episode of our Wednesday webinar. So excited to have Danelle Hogan, who has been an expert on our webinar before. However, she is going to talk to us all about systems thinking, well, excuse me, stemazing systems thinking. Uh, Danelle is stemazing, an emphasis on the amazing part. She has so many STEM resources to share with you, but particularly today, we're going to talk about systems thinking. And Danelle, I'm just really excited to hear what you have to say. But before we get into it too far, I, I want you to just tell our viewers a little bit about you. Yeah, so thanks for having me, Corey. I'm super excited to be here again and excited to talk about systems thinking as it relates to the work I'm doing now. Because for nine years, I built this amazing project and then now I'm focusing on amazing systems thinking. So uh, really helping teachers integrate the habits and tools of systems thinking into their uh, STEM classrooms. And I'm doing that work with the Water Center for Systems Thinking, which I'm super excited about. So yeah, that's what we're up to these days. I love it. And I, so it's a bit of a rebrand, but I have to say that anytime I think of STEM and amazing, I think Danelle Hogan, you <laughs> have absolutely cornered the market on making uh, teaching STEM easy, fun, rigorous, and exciting. So I, I can't wait to hear how systems thinking is kind of that bigger vision that you can share with all of us in the education sphere and how we can use systems thinking in our classrooms. So without further ado, I, I know that you chose a very interesting quote today. If you wouldn't mind reading that quote, and just setting the stage for our learning today. Yeah, so systems thinking is a discipline for seeing holes. It's a framework for seeing interrelationships rather than things, for seeing patterns of change rather than static snapshots. And that's a quote from Peter Senge, who's uh, a well-known systems thinker. Uh, and so I really like that. And I think it kind of lays the foundation for how we think about uh, and why we value systems thinking in the STEM classroom. It's all about looking at parts of a whole and systems, which are everywhere, and then trying to figure out what we can do with them. And, and what I love about that is it goes right along with the engineering design process, which is what we talk about all the time in our STEM professional development. So I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, the Waters Institute has to, has ha the influence that where you're uh, bringing us today. So tell us a little bit about where we're going and what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so quickly, we're just going to kind of dive in and look at what are the habits of a system sinker. And these habits have been designed and developed over um, decades of work here at the Water Center for System Sinking. And so we'll look at those and see what they have to offer us in our classrooms. And then we'll look at some of the visual tools of system sinking. Um, that will be familiar to a lot of people in some ways. And then we'll talk about some of the ways that we're putting those into practice with slow reveal graphs and some new engineering design challenges that we've just designed with some of our teacher leaders that I know you're going to love. Ooh, all right. You just, you, you perked my interest. Engineering design, slow reveal graphs. All right, I'm 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 excited. So let's jump right in. <laughs> So I think it's important to start with what systems thinking is and what it is not. So it's definitely a learning strategy for any setting. So while we're, you know, really focusing on the context of the STEM classroom today, these obviously are habits and tools that can be used and are used in all areas of study. Uh, they are a visual, verbal, and kinesthetic tools for analysis. So oftentimes the lessons involve moving around and, and trying to find systems and doing different things. And it's also just a shared vocabulary for defining problems and finding solutions. So if we're all using that same vocabulary, the same habits and tools, then it's gonna make it easier. And this can start from pre-K and we have, and we do, and go all the way up into adulthood, which makes it really valuable if we can all be on the same page here. So it's not a curriculum or a lesson plan or like a silver bullet for how to have the best classroom in the world. Uh, it's, a, it's a learning strategy for, it, for any setting. What I love about that is that it's not a specific teaching program because we all know that programs can come and go, but culture and mindset st stays around. 
So I, and the other piece, that third piece of shared vocabulary for defining problems and finding solutions. So on our previous webinar, we had a social studies teacher really talking specifically about systems thinking. So this is just timely. And I think our society as a whole needs to start thinking this way in general, because there is no such thing anymore as a a graphic designer without someone who has to know a lot about the web and web design. So I think this whole system, looking at everybody together, I mean, project management with, with tools like Trello or Monday, I mean, this is, this is the wave of the future. And if students aren't prepared for it, I think they might suffer. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And if you're not seeing systems everywhere, then you're not looking. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think it's just, uh, we really want to, I used to tell my physics students, we want to ruin the way that they look at the world in that they should see <laughs> physics everywhere. And that's what we want to do with systems thinkers, right? We want them to see that everything is a system and everything is a part of bigger systems. And how can we use that knowledge and strategies to solve some problems? I love it. I love it. Okay. Cards. So these are our habits of a systems thinker. Uh, it used to be 12, it's now 14. Uh, and just over years and years of work and also coming from the field of systems thinking, these habits have been really uh, defined and refined over those decades that our group has been working on this. And so you will recognize things here that should sound familiar, like things that you would want anybody to be able to do, considers an issue fully and resists the urge to come to a quick conclusion. That's a great one. Oh, yeah. uh, you'll also, one of our favorite activities to have students and teachers do right away is map these to the science and engineering practices. So how oh. do they overlap? And I think one of the most brilliant things I heard one of our teachers say in a, in a workshop recently was, you know, I was asking, why do you like the habits compared to the practices uh, for science and engineering? And she said something like, well, you know, science and engineering practices are great in that world, but these are universal. And that's exactly yes. what we want. It was like, yay. Uh, yes, that's exactly what we want. These are universal. And so you're considering short and long-term consequences and the accumulations of things over time, those rates of change. These are things that come up, not just in personal relationship kinds of systems, not just in political systems, not just in school systems, but also in systems that you might find in science and engineering as well, technology, computer systems. So again, yeah, I'm looking at time really delays right here, the time delays and you're, you're, you're being realistic, right? And you say habits and habit goes with mindset, not the program, but the culture, the mindset. It, time delays happen. There's sometimes there are things that are out of our control. So I love that the universal concept of systems thinking, but I'm really interested how as to how you bring that into the science and engineering practices. Yeah, and I should say too that our our founder's favorite uh, habit was successive approximation. He was also an engineer, oh. so I think that. Oh, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so Jim Waters really loved that successive approximation where you try something and then you fiddle with it, and you try it again, and then you fiddle with it. So that is definitely a favorite and it is easy to see its connection to engineering for sure. That is so great. So All I right. just, yeah, I wanted to focus in a little bit on a couple of these habits cards and we do have physical cards that people can purchase, but these are all free and available on our website. You know that I love stuff that's free and available for teachers. And so this is on our website and um, you can flip the card. So if you go to the next slide, you can then see some of the questions on the back of these cards that um, help you with your thinking. And you can also start to see how some of the tools naturally line up with some of these habits. So we're seeing a behavior over time graph on that change over time habit uh, and seeing how things change over time, which is like is such a fundamental habit. Um, but then it has questions to kind of help guide thinking or um expand your thinking. So how have elements changed over time and what you're looking at? Patterns, patterns, patterns. What patterns are we seeing emerge over time? Uh, and so these really do, again, regardless of what subject you're teaching, these can really help guide your thinking. And also on our website, because we've done so much work internationally, these cards are already available in many languages, including Spanish and Farsi and Mandarin and uh, Turkish and on and on. So there's a there's that's a great resource as well, especially if you have some English language learners, we might um, have the cards in in their native language, which would be great, too. Well, and it just shows the global effort of systems thinking like we have to think about other perspectives that are at the table. 
Um, I love the fact that patterns in mathematics, I mean, that's just what mathematics is looking for those patterns. So I just find that so fascinating. And, and Corey, you've called out one of the habits, changing perspectives, right? So again, well done. <laughs> and it, it, shows later, right? it shows you how natural it is, right? It absolutely uh, and is. so these are the visual tools of systems thinking. Uh, and again, these are pretty recognizable across different systems thinking um, areas, but behavior over time graphs are one of my favorites. And I always like, we, you know, we love picture books. We use tons of amazing picture books in our work. And uh, some of the work that I've done with my boss, Sherry Marlin, we've had uh, folks graph the emotion of a character over time in a story. And you can think about like, when were they happy? When were they sad? Or when were they confident? When did they lose confidence? And what was happening in the story to cause those changes? And so behavior over time graphs are incredibly powerful and again, can start very early with even pre-K students drawing out simple behavior over time graphs. Um, and then there's causal loops and stock flow uh, maps that can get very technical and mathy and like super intense in terms of the modeling that you can do with them, but then they can also be done very simply. Um, looking at different connections within a system. And then connection circles are a favorite, looking at all the parts and pieces of a system and then thinking about how they're connected. And there's a really great triangles activity where you get a big group of people to track two people and always stay equidistant from them. And you can see how that system moves and changes as people are connected in different ways. And then the iceberg and the ladder of inference are super popular um, because again, people bring a lot with them to the table in terms of their personal experiences and how that really does impact the way that you look at the world and things that you might wanna consider before you make some decisions. And then of course, everything that we're seeing up here in that iceberg in the system is really driven by the system that is below that waterline, which are those patterns of behavior, the structure of that system and your own mental models, like how you're making sense of the world. And if you wanna change what's happening up here, you gotta focus on this stuff that's going on below the surface. Like, yeah, I feel like this is what every young student needs to know because just the behavior over time graphs, you know, your amount of homework or effort you're putting into this course is going to lead to, you know, over time, some really good uh, outcomes. If you don't, it will lead to outcomes that aren't as successful. I mean, that's just universal from a student perspective. And I absolutely love that technology can really show this in a visual concept for students today, where, whereas when I went to school, uh, I was, it wasn't very visual. My mom kept telling me, but I, you know, had to listen to her, right? <laughs> we all know how we feel about listening to our mamas. But with that said, um, look, tell me about the slow reveal graph. Well, slow reveal graphs are my new favorite thing right now. And you know that I have new favorite things all the time, but uh, this I just have fallen in love with. And in working with some of our teacher leaders, uh, it's just lent itself to a routine that is really useful. So we're going to experience one in uh, like hyperspeed because you would never go this fast with students. But I just want folks to get a sense of what the routine is and why it would be useful. So in slow okay. reveal graphs, yes, you show students just a visual. And you have them notice and wonder, which of course we love. And this is really connected to that ladder of inference. So what are students bringing to the table? So what do they notice? What do they wonder? And they're gonna notice lots of stuff, right? Like, oh, there's different colors. There's five of them. Some are bigger than others. And then we'll reveal a new piece of it, right? And in these slow reveal graphs, I have put in safety slides. So when you click, whoa, if I didn't want, cause I oftentimes click too many times. And so I've always put in, a safety slide, hot tip, like you should do this all the time. And Love so it. I have a safety slide there, but if you click again, then we will reveal some additional information in our graph. And then you can have students think about, ooh, now what information did we get? And what do we think this graph might be about now? And you'll also okay. see a question mark where we have that question mark, like what would this, what, what do you think that percentage is gonna be? And then they're gonna use the information that they have to make a guess and kind of like how, where did you come up with that, that number, right? I love so, it. I, I just want to go back real quick because 
just so our audience is aware, the safety slide is the same slide that was before this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it allows us as a teacher to be like, wait a minute, did I click too far and reveal something that I wasn't supposed to reveal? And so I love that hot tip. And I also <laughs> love that it's in Spanish. So all you are, you've just, again, uh, clicked on that global audience, especially the one, um, you know, that that is prevalent in Arizona, the, the Spanish speakers. So thank you for that. Okay, so now we are revealing a little yeah. bit more. You've got yeah. that question so, mark. So kids are going to oh. make their guess and then they'll talk with their peers about what number did they pick and why? What was their reasoning for that? And then, yeah, well, then we'll reveal some more information after a safety slide, of course. Oh, see, I, okay. <laughs> I wanted to explain that so teachers understand. And by the way, folks, all of this will be in the show notes. So you will have the, uh, you know, kind of a link to this uh, slide deck as well as the um, information from, from Danelle's website. So thank you, Danelle. Yeah. And then, so then they get to see that it's 11.7%. So some people maybe got close to that in their thinking and it's still, we're trying to real. And, and when we're asking them what they think the graph could be about at this point, we want them to be wickedly creative and, and just throw anything out there because at this point it could be anything, right? It could be I percentage of kinds of pets that people have in the United States. It could be percentage of whatever. So I think that's also important for students to get just wacky and crazy ideas out there so that they feel comfortable making guesses. Now, as we get more and more information, you're going to have to really narrow that down. But yeah, so when we reveal the next bit of information, now we're going to know something a little bit more concrete. Ooh. See, and so, I was thinking even the colors could go with, you know, kids will be like, well, maybe it's, you know, apples versus pears being the colors or whatever I mean yeah, just crazy it's, thoughts right it's fascinating you say that because I definitely know that the colors make a big difference in some of the guesses so it okay. does it, well, some students will notice that and then again something in their brain that's connected to those colors will push them to have an idea about what it might be about and so then here of course students are going to be guessing like what do they think these are now and they should have some more very refined guesses about what it might be. And then we're going to reveal not all of them at once, but one of them. So then we'll go on to the next one. And during that time when students are interacting, I also really want to call out this alone zone time where they get time to just think on their own and write down some ideas and then share with some partners because um, that really values their own processing time and gives them a chance to really think about what they could be, it could be about. And then we're going to find out that that middle one is oh. petroleum and that this actually is Arizona electricity consumption by primary source from 2020. Wow. And then the question is, what are the other sources for electricity? So we don't get, a, we get a very tiny fraction. It doesn't even make it to a 10th of a percent from petroleum. Thankfully, we're not burning a lot of petroleum to <laughs> use electricity. But what are the other sources for electricity um, generation in Arizona? And then they get to talk about those and think about what they might, um, what those might, those symbols might stand for. And then they'll find out that they actually are coal, Hello. natural gas, and renewable energy is all kind of lumped into one. Sometimes folks think that that um, blue flame is water. They think it might be hydro. Um, but the renewables are all kind of chunked together over there. And then nuclear power, Arizona actually has one of the, the actually has the largest nuclear power plant in the United States, Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station. So that percentage for us is very large, whereas for other states, it might not be uh, there at all. So yeah, super interesting. And then this is all related to fourth grade standards on renewable and non-renewable energy sources. So this would be that driving hook to get them interested in it. And then from here, we're going to look at how this varies by regions around the United States and on and on. So those slow reveal graphs are just a phenomenal way to engage students in all kinds of awesome thinking and just get them primed for like, what else are we going to learn about now? Well, and I absolutely love this because my brain is going right to the Palo Verde nuclear uh, plant because that is an industry that outreaches to with STEM education in our state. Um, but you could add that element, you know, in one of your slow reveals so that so that students could start to maybe research that particular, you know, that nuclear power in Arizona versus nuclear power somewhere else. I think that is just genius because it's connected. Again, as you say, it's a system. So, all right, thank you so much. I can't even, there's so much I'm taking away from the slow reveal graphs, but you have, yeah. but wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. And also on the slow reveal graphs, it's important for teachers to know there's a whole website of those. So you don't even really have to start from scratch. And of course, we have two that are specific to Arizona standards. 
one about tides for sixth grade and then this one for energy in fourth grade. So don't start from scratch. Definitely use the slow reveal graph site. And ours, ours are getting hosted on that actual website as well, which is really cool. Oh, that's nice. So, and those will be in the show notes as well, those resources. So thank you so much for allowing our teachers to really get what they need and move right into the classroom immediately. So tell me about NAU Raytheon STEM challenge. Yeah. So over the last couple of years, we've designed these STEM challenges for, um, with some funding from NAU and also some support from Raytheon. And there are now five of these awesome challenges that we have put together. And the, each challenge has its own engineering journal. Corey, you know that I love these sciencing and engineering journals that we have, yes. and we keep adding to the collection. And a huge yeah. shout out to Anna Heyer and Sherry Dennis who helped develop these with me. But um, they're all based on, all the challenges are inspired by picture books, which are shown here. Um, and you know they're really designed for that fourth grade to eighth grade level, I would say, but you could certainly adjust them for um, younger or older students as well. Right now we have some fifth grade uh, students that are working on these here in Tucson uh, funded by NAU. Uh, and so it's also pretty STEM on the cheap. I mean, Trash to Treasure is looking at, you know, a waste stream and how can you design something, upcycle those, those materials into something that you might be able to use. Good Nightlight Challenge is about somebody who's afraid of the dark and designing a fanciful nightlight for a, some person that might be afraid of the dark. Howling Home is actually inspired by a real design challenge at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum here outside of Tucson. They uh, are needing to redesign the, the enclosure for the wolves and using wolf psychology and what we know about good design and keeping animals engaged in zoos. Um, they're looking at how to, students are looking at how to redesign their wolf enclosure. And then the flying saucer cups and the better than bot helicopter props are uh, really great engineering challenges that have to do a little bit with aerospace. And the two books that those are based on, Woodwire and Wings and The Girl that Who Could Fix Anything, are nonfiction picture books, one of my favorite genres, uh, about some really cool women in the aerospace engineering um, areas that students can hopefully be inspired by as well. But those... Wow. Those journals kind of help guide students through that engineering design process, report their results. And then we always have like marketing at the end or like for flying cups, they're trying to change it into a game and then they have to market the game and think about the rules. So that's also layered into that as well. And here's some great pictures from some of our fifth graders uh, that did the good night light challenge at the top. And those are some of their wolf yeah. and culture designs at the bottom. Oh, that is just so exciting. And just a shameless plug, folks, Sherry Dennis and Danelle Hogan were on our Wednesday webinar back in 2020, and they really talk about the engineering design journals and why they're so, why they're just so hands-on for students to really start to think about different perspectives and how to recreate. And I think that's what's happening here is the recreation utilizing the engineering design principles. So, wow. It's all that's just I'm just so excited by by the evolution of of the journals um, at, at this point. And thank you for making this available for our teachers. Yeah, yeah. And so really, in a nutshell, that's, you know, just a real brief introduction to systems thinking and why I'm why I'm so excited about it. And some of our most recent work related to, uh, you know, really integrating the habits and tools of systems thinking into STEM classrooms. Oh my goodness, uh, Danelle, I can't even, like uh, one of the things I took away that I, I've i just been like, wow. What, I mean, it's simple, but pro profound. You said uh, the alone zone. I love that. You're giving students time to think by themselves. And I believe that is uh, some, I think we need to make time for that process because a lot of students, you know, they just go right to the next thing, whether it's the, you know, their their electronic device or, okay, teacher, help me. And when you start to say, no, I really start to think about it, like that slow reveal graph, what what is your idea? And your idea is valid. So thank you so much for the loans on. That's one thing I took away in addition to the slow reveal graphs. Oh my goodness. All of the design, uh, engineering design journal and, and that, that cha the STEM challenges. Um, it just seems like the, the, the world is so small when we work together. Just, uh, to, so as a systems thinker, I'd like to know that we're all working together for uh, for a great cause. But yeah, we one. hope so. And again, we are always looking for feedback too on the journals or if people have ideas about slow reveal graphs and they're mystified about where to start. 
you know, we're always happy to help. So yeah, and better, so we'll together, put, better together for sure. Better together. And we'll, we'll make sure that your information um, is in our show notes. So folks go to the show notes and, and take all of this away with you uh, right into the classroom as early as tomorrow or whenever you're watching this, you could take it in the next hour. Um, our why is to empower, educate and inspire our community so they take action to fulfill their purpose and to serve others. We appreciate that you are here with us today. Don't forget to connect with us on social. And if there's anything we can do to support you in your learning or teaching journey, that is what we are all about at GCU K-12 ED. Uh, again, our canyonpd.com site is where you can go to get on demand, low cost, individualized courses, especially in STEM. Hopefully we'll have a uh, Danelle Hogan, maybe as a guest expert to teach one of those courses for us. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nod, <laughs> nod. Sounds good to um, me. <laughs> it'll be a lot of fun. So we'll uh, we'll, we'll be with you uh, next month for our next Wednesday webinar. Subscribe now for more free PD. Until next time, we appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Danelle. Thank you.